nothing deep tonight. I just felt something in my spirit talking to my family. Amen. And just preparing our hearts for what's coming next. Amen. I, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to the coming days. And I believe God's going to do something. So we'll jump right to it. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, while you're already on your feet. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. I don't believe I'm going to say anything tonight that you haven't already heard, but I believe I need to say it again. Somebody say again. again. And so I believe that God has um, just been ministering to me in my spirit all week long about something, and then I heard it again today uh, in pastor's class, and I just knew that it was right and it was on time. Just mentioned briefly, but I believe God is, is doing something with our hearts. I believe that God is... Um, fashioning a people who have come to a place of maturity uh, to begin to walk in their maturity. Uh, begin to walk in that and begin to see the fruits of it. Zechariah chapter 3 verses 1 through 10. Next, somebody say next. next. Next, I saw Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord with Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, may the Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is it this man like a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood there before the angel. The angel spoke up to those standing all around, remove his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, I have freely forgiven your iniquity and will dress you in fine clothing. Then I spoke up, let a clean turban be put on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood nearby. Then the angel of the Lord exhorted Joshua solemnly. The Lord who rules over all says, if you live and work according to my requirements, you will be able to preside over my temple and attend to my courtyards. And I will allow you to come and go among these others who are standing by you. Listen now, Joshua, the high priest, both you and your colleagues who are sitting before you. All of you are a symbol that I'm about to introduce my servant, the branch. As for the stone I have set before Joshua, on the one stone there are seven eyes. And I'm about to engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord who rules over all, to the effect that I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, says the Lord who rules over all, everyone will invite his friend to fellowship under his vine and under his fig tree. Ah, look at your neighbor say, come see my relationship. Come see my relationship with God. Then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 says, Some of us have been given special ability as apostles to others he has given the gift of being able to preach well. Some have special ability in winning people to Christ, helping them to trust him as their savior. Still others have a gift for caring for God's people as a shepherd does his sheep, leading and teaching them in the ways of God. Why is it that he gives us these special abilities to do certain things best? It is that God's people will be equipped to do better work for him, building up the church, the body of Christ, to a position of strength and maturity. Father, we thank you on tonight. We bless you. Now, God, I ask that you would just help me to speak with authority and clarity. But, God, that I might inspire by your words uh, someone to want to do more of what you've asked us to do, to be more of who you've asked us to be, and to walk in the light that you have given us. We thank you. We love you. We honor you and help us, God, as we go along this way, that we don't get tied up and crossed up and cause a lot of things to trip us up, that we forget why you even saved us and why you rescued us and left us here. We honor you so much, but we can't do it without you. Help me tonight just to talk, just to teach, just to do it your way. And God, you may get all the glory, the praise and the honor in Jesus name. Amen. Touch three people and tell them, be strong. And don't forget why you're here. Don't forget why you are here. Uh, as 
as I already stated, I don't think it's going to be real deep tonight. I'm, I'm just feeling like uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit. Uh, most of you that have come, got, have gotten accustomed to me, you know that uh, a lot of times I just teach and preach right, right out of my own experiences of life and what I go through daily and how it culminates up until the time that it's ready time to minister. And so whatever's been going on, however my life has been turning, and then I hear from the Lord to speak about it, speak to it, uh, and use these as examples and examples to help bless somebody else. So here we are today. I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm becoming, I'm becoming, I'm not like, but I'm becoming like the sons of Issachar. I try to pay very close attention to the times and the seasons so that I know how I ought to act. I think one of the things that we fail in in the body of Christ is understanding proper etiquette in the kingdom. And proper etiquette just simply says you know how to respond when God says something. That you know how to respond when God is doing something. Etiquette just means that you are mannerable uh, to the things that are at the table. And so we're just understanding that when God begins to shift things and when God begins to do things and when God speaks prophetically into our lives, we're supposed to respond as if he already did it. Yeah, we're supposed to act like that once God says it, it's a done data. And that we're not supposed to give any speculation to it. And we're not supposed to be pessimistic people looking at all the difficulty that is, that is around what God is saying supposed to take place. But being optimistic and real people saying that, yeah, it looks hard, but God's still able. Yeah. Amen. I ain't nothing wrong with it looking hard as long as you know that God is still able. I, I think it's best for God to get glory when it looks hard. I think it's better for God to get all the praise that he deserves when it looks hard. So he doesn't want it not to look hard. He just wants us to remember that he's able. And so I'm excited about this fresh start that we're, that we're getting. I'm excited about this new beginning. I'm excited about this new day. I'm excited about what we found out from the Message Bible, this Genesis week uh, that God has given us out of the midst of our chaos. I, I just believe that when I woke up this morning, I sensed uh, even Monday, I sensed myself having a uh, new or renewed focus. I sensed myself being able to see better. I sensed myself having better vision. Amen. I sensed myself being able to see farther. I thought, it, I thought I had been healed in the Holy Ghost and I didn't need my glasses no more. I put my glasses off and it was still blurry. I put them back on and I realized it wasn't in the natural, but it was in the spirit that I could see a little farther than I was able to see just a few days ago. I don't know what happened. I didn't uh, pray a special prayer. Then nobody lay hands on me, but it's something about the times. It's something about what God has determined allows things to take place. So I, I began to get vision. I began to see something and I began to write some stuff down. And not only uh, did my focus change, I, I believe my zeal increased. I, I, I began to get excited again. I began to get that heart thump again. I began to beat fast. You know how it is when you get around somebody that either makes you, uh, keeps you in awe or somebody that you love. When you get around them, your heart begins to pitter-pat. You can't wait. Uh, y'all acting like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I bet you Carla and Craig know what I'm talking about. That when they come home from work, it's just something about a new love. It just makes you I look at him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my baby, and I don't mean maybe. It makes you pitter pat. It gets you excited. And all, you just feel like you can do anything. I just woke up just ready to take on the world just because something has shifted in my spirit. And watch this. And it's not because everything's going perfectly. It ain't like everything been fixed. It ain't like everything's all right. I just know it's going to be all right. Look at your neighbor and say, everything is going. I just believe that God is not going to allow it to stay like this. And I feel like something's getting ready to bust loose. Uh, I'm busting loose. I just feel like God is getting ready to call something to just break up so that I can walk through it. And listen, I, I don't even want to break through nothing no more. I just want God to break it down so I can walk in it. I don't want to accidentally hurt myself trying to force my way into something that God has for me. I just want to begin to walk in this thing. So I believe in the Holy Ghost that 
God is getting ready to tear some stuff down for me. I feel like Joshua and the children of Israel at the wall of Jericho. I just believe that if I open up my mouth, that if I shout hallelujah the right way, the right number of times on the right day, that that wall will come tumbling down and I'll be able to walk into my destiny and my next dimension. Somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah, I just believe that we're in that season that God is going to bring some stuff together and we're going to begin to see stuff happen expeditiously. Yeah, I I remember the Bible talked about Esther and all of a sudden, right in the midst of the story, it says, and suddenly... I'm looking for some and suddenly to take place in my life. And I don't mean where it ramped up. I mean where what nothing happened and then and suddenly. I like it when God does that. He puts a comma in the word and then he just does something that's extraterrestrial. I need something like that in my life and I'm believing it's about to happen. I'm believing God that it's about to to take place and you know and again it's not because everything is good and I feel real healthy in my body and my money's overflowing and everybody's acting right that's around me and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do 100% crossing every T and dotting every I because you know it is September some of y'all don't understand what that means it's like every September hell opens up and everything that could go wrong starts to go wrong I catch it from the left and the right the front and the back but if it wasn't like that I wouldn't know October was around the corner so September is my indicator that God's getting ready to do something and that we're on the right track and it seems like the enemy finds every way possible to try to bring some level of turbulence into my life that something has to go haywire and topsy-turvy it's like he tries to bother my mind and gets me to think on things that I shouldn't be thinking on when I know the word says whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are a good report whatsoever things are worthy of praise whatsoever things are virtue think on these things he tries to bother my mind and then I know emotions make you cry sometimes he begins to bother my emotions and I get sensitive when I wasn't even sensitive stuff start to bother me that didn't used to bother me I get to watching movies and start crying with the people on TV is something about the enemy starts trying to make my emotions extra sensitive and then I begin to snap and go off and at the fool because I'm being driven by my emotions and then when I get them under wraps my body starts to hurt he starts to mess with my back and my stomach in my head and my nose y'all ain't helping me in here the enemy knows how to bother every area of your life and just when I get prayer just when somebody lays hands just when somebody speaks over my life it seems like I reach in my pocket and don't pull out nothing but lint I don't even smoke crack no more but where did my money go where did my money go I remember when I used to get high and you had a pocket full of money you come back that night you ain't got nothing and can't remember where it went but I ain't got high in a long time and I still can't find my money something's happening the enemy's trying to break up even socially frustrating my relationships and getting in the way of friendships and straining things and making things hard I'm trying to figure out what in the world is going on and if that ain't enough he bothers your spirit You even got to fight in the spirit. You got to begin to deal with your own spirit because the enemy tries to confuse your theology. He'll begin to make you think about things in the wrong perspective. Ah, If you're not careful when you're going through, you'll try to make the Bible say some stuff. I don't know about you, but I study. I'm talking to people that study. If you don't study it, it ain't going to make no difference. But I'm talking about the, the Bible then begins to look weird. Yeah, I'm going to tell you how I know that the Bible begins to look weird to us because uh, when we're going through, we quit reading it. You all of a sudden get too tired for the word. That's because you don't want to see what the Spirit is saying to you. And the enemy's trying to disrupt and upset our wholeness. That's why Jesus always said, by your faith, you've been made what? 
whole. And the enemy tries to come and bother the whole of man, those six key areas that keeps man together. But I come tonight to say that the devil is a liar. And I dare about 10 of y'all, ain't but about 15 of y'all in here. So if we can get two thirds of y'all to shout right in the devil's face, I believe that you'll disrupt heaven while I disrupt hell while hell's trying to disrupt you. Sometimes you got to just holler back at what's hollering at you. Every now and then when a dog bark, I bark back. I dare you to bark back at the devil and tell him I ain't afraid of you, sucker. I got teeth and you don't. I'm standing on a word and you ain't got one. I got a promise in the promise promise that you got is a burn in hell. Somebody shout hallelujah. Sometimes you got to learn how to bark back. Slap your neighbor and say, you better bark back. You better bark back. Quit all that crying and running and bark back and mean it. The enemy is allowing calls and stuff to come, tests and temptation, tribulation and trials, but I believe that when you begin to witness and you begin to experience all of these things exponentially and they're coming one after the other and it seems like you can't get relief and it won't stop and as soon as you plug up one hole you start seeing water coming from somewhere else and you don't know what to do and you start thinking that you're underneath Murphy's Law everything that could go wrong does go wrong and you, you just feel like you, you, you're upside down and discombobulated well God told me today that that's an indication that there's something in the exit area of the second heavens that's making its way into your life and the enemy's trying to stop it. He recognizes it because it's a blessing with your name on it. It's something that you prayed for and been waiting on that God has opened up the second heavens to release. And the enemy's trying to frustrate you to get you out of position so you can't receive what God has for you. And why the enemy is so mad, the enemy's mad because after all you've been through, all the hell you done caused, that God still did with you he's mad because God kicked him out but he's still fooling with you ain't that something the enemy got kicked out right away but God's still holding on to us that's why the Bible says hold on or the, the hymn that said hold on to God's what unchanging hand the enemy's mad because he got kicked out but look at your neighbor say I ain't going nowhere God is going to hold on to you and the enemy is upset. Anybody thankful God still fools with you? Uh, Anybody excited that God still has his hand on your life? Anybody thankful that God has not left you and he should have left you long time ago? Because if you were king of the universe, you'd have left you loud long time ago. You'd have dropped you off on somebody else's doorstep and say, you deal with them. But God has held on to us because he's faithful. And he refuses to let us go, even when we think we've been doing everything all right. That's what I love about God. It ain't the person that know they've been jacked up that ought to be real thankful God held on to them. But it's the people that think you've been doing it all right. And then God finally shine the light on you and show you that you ain't as slick as you thought you was. You've been messing up for a while. Your mind ain't been in the right place. You've been serving your belly and not your savior. You've been doing what's been good to your mind and not what's been right by the book. But because I am God and I'm Jehovah, I got mercy on you and I'm not going to allow the enemy to trip you up and to take you out of my hand that's that's why it's important that we are very careful of how we navigate during this season we're very careful of the people that we put around us we got to make sure that you don't have folk cheering for you while you're going in the wrong direction Lord have mercy. I was watching bloopers the other day. I went online and was just watching the 2011's best bloopers. And there was this basketball game. And the boy got the tip off. And he started dribbling. And all the fans were going crazy. Screaming and hollering and shouting. And he made this basket. And everybody went crazy. Everybody was shouting and screaming. And he made the basket at the wrong basket. And I thought. 
thought to myself, they should have been hollering, turn around. It's dangerous to live at the cheers of folk that'll let you go in the wrong direction. Because you know the same one that was hollering for him talked about him like a dog after the game. It's important that you get around people who's got the right spirit. About two o'clock today, I wrote something down. Even as a pastor, we don't get to pick and choose who God sends. And I'm saying it for me. I'm just being honest with what went on my mind. You, you put it, make it relative for you. Because sometimes you don't get to pick and choose who God assigns to your testimony. Who God puts you around, somebody say momentarily. But, but I, I, I recognize even as a pastor, though I can't pick and choose, I do have to take better inventory about who gets close. See, because it ain't about how much they mess up. It's really about what's in their spirit. See, because when you're in a season where God is moving you, where God is trying to push you somewhere, you got to be careful of the lazy, reluctant, get over spirits that try to attach themselves to you. As God is bringing you out of something and beginning to turn your life around, you can't be in covenant with rebellious, cantankerous spirits. You, you, you've got to be careful that you don't allow yourself to get influenced by that Jezebelian, I got to have it my way, causing confusion spirit. You've got to be careful that when God is trying to renew your passion and get you back involved in the things of God, that you get yourself away from them evil, indifferent, this ain't all that spirit. People who are deceiving and non-conforming, hanging around because won't nobody else take them spirit. People that's just here because they ain't got nowhere else to go. They don't really want to be around you, but they hanging on because don't nobody else want them. you got to be careful of how you live. Let these people infuse your life because it's too important that you don't have baggage that you didn't claim when you try to take off on the plane because it might be an indictment against you. You know what they say in the airport. If that baggage don't belong to you, don't you pick it up because if you pick up something that don't belong to you, it might be a felony in the Holy Ghost. You don't know what kind of stuff other people carry it and you've got to be sure that whatever you fly with you brought it yourself yeah tap somebody and say want to get away want to get a you got to be sure that you don't allow the wrong type of spirit to begin to take over your spirit and I just feel like I done got tired of it and it's time to get on top of it. People who act like they mad at you because God forced them to be around you. Folk trying to show you the love of God and you standing in judgment of them. Watch this. While they sitting around and tolerating somebody else's foolishness. Yeah, I didn't even know until the Lord took me there this afternoon that there was a scripture that helped me with my thinking. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 1 through 7 says, Paul talking to the church said, will you put up with a little foolish aside from me? In other words, I ain't perfect, but can't you give me a break? He said, please, just for a moment. He said, the thing that has me so upset is that I care about you so much. This is the passion of God burning inside me. I promised your hand in marriage to Christ. I presented you as a pure virgin to her husband. And now I'm afraid that exactly as the snake seduced Eve with his smooth pattern, you're being lured away from the simple purity of your love for Christ. It seems that if someone shows up preaching quite another Jesus than we preach, watch this, with a different spirit, a different message, you put up with them quite nicely. 
In other words, here we are trying to give you all we got, telling you the truth. You giving us hell, and then somebody come with some foolishness, and you want to treat them with the love of Jesus. He said, I'm confused about what's really going on. He said, but you know, you put up with these big shot apostles. You want to hang around these folk while you can't put up with simple old me. Watch what Paul said, but I'm as good as they are. It's true. I don't have their voice. Haven't mastered their smooth eloquence that impress you so much. Watch this. But when I do open my mouth, at least I know what I'm talking about. We haven't kept anything back and we let you in on everything. You want to run around with folk that like to hold stuff back so they can hold stuff over you and all we did is gave you everything we got and now you act like you can't tolerate us. He said, I wonder, did I make a bad mistake in proclaiming God's message to you without asking you for something in return? He said, maybe serving you free of charge so that you wouldn't be inconvenienced by me might have got you confused about our relationship. Slap somebody and say, evaluate. We have to evaluate who is around us. You love them, but they act like they doing you a favor and be comparing you to folk who care less about them. Watch this. You know what you do being a blessing on the job to people, trying to give them the heads up so they don't get fired. You know what you do in school, trying to help somebody's crazy tail pass class, and then they steady, draining, and dogging you, and then you're trying to wonder why God wants to use you to help them. And then when you get to work or school, you look up and they kicking it with the same ones that's dogging them. Paul said, I'm confused about what's really going on. I done let y'all around me. I done gave you everything I had. I done gave you the heads up of the enemy's ploy. You act like you doing me a favor by being around. And then when I look up the same ones I warned you about, you kicking with. He said, I got to be careful of folk with different spirits. Who they are don't make a difference if they spirit ain't. Right. This is a season where you can love your neighbor without hanging with them if they ain't trying to go nowhere or go in the same direction that you're trying to go in. Sometimes it don't, it will pay you. I told somebody the other day, it might pay you to pay them to leave. We've got to evaluate what's around us because God is trying to do something with us. And then you got to be honest with yourself and make sure you ain't one of the ones that somebody else might need to get rid of. Don't you think more of yourself than you ought to think because you might be the very issue that's messing with the boat. You may be the very stench that's changing the aroma in the room. Especially when every time the bishop mentions certain type of people, you just take for granted that it ain't you. Remember, God would only give a word for the people who show up. (laughs) He ain't preaching to the folk that don't come. He's not depending on them to get the CD and the DVD. Slap somebody and say, he talking to us as if you like it or not. All of us are privy to the word of God. Even when it don't sound like what I think I look like. 
It's a time where you need to be around people who are going to encourage you, who's going to push you toward excellence. People who are going to hold you accountable to the thing that you've already proclaimed about yourself. Folk who will cover you and compel you to walk in purpose. Who won't allow you to walk uncircumspectly. Who won't allow you just to wander through the wilderness and tiptoe through the tulips. People who expect you to do what God has called you to do and when you're not... They're going to call you on the carpet about it. People that's not going to laugh at all your silly jokes, especially when your silly jokes don't line up with your silly life. God is saying, I need some people around me that will provoke me unto holy jealousy that not want to make me want to be like them, but people that will cause me to want to walk in what God has called me to walk in because I'm watching them do it with diligence and excellence. People who are provoking me unto the good work that God predestined before in my life, before the foundation of the world. Folk who make me uneasy because in my complacency I sit there like I got it going on but when I really evaluate who I am I ain't doing nothing but I'm watching people operate in the thing that God called them to do while I was trying to be indifferent and funny style Ah, I don't have to try to do stuff to try to fit in I want to be around people that won't trick me into compromising who I am but people who will uh, give me an exhortation and they'll applaud my diversity. I ain't got to be just like you for you to be excited about who I am. As long as I'm doing what God has called me to do, you'll clap your hands for me a little while. And every now and then, people who will not only applaud who I am, but share with me who they are without being intimidated. I'm always amazed at people that won't pour out all of themselves because they want to hold it back so they can keep position. People that won't celebrate your life are dangerous. People that don't want to see you become all you're supposed to be, they're dangerous. So in this season... You've got to understand that God is doing some shifting and some sifting. Sifting's good. Because what sifting does, even though sometimes it's painful, sifting for wheat and seeds breaks the hard shell off that was protecting it until it was time to mature. So sifting makes you grow up. Sifting gets you out of your infantile state. You can no longer be juvenile once you've been sifted. Because what's protected you all along is gone. And now you've got to be the seed that you've been called to be. So God is telling us that we're in a strategic time and then we're strategic days in the life of every believer. These are strategic days. I told you Sunday that we were coming upon and we were walking in the celebration of Rosh Hashanah and we declared that God was going to give us this good and sweet year by saying Shana Tova Yumataka and God was going to do something great for us but not only has God determined to do something great for us but they shout that because God has sustained us to this point so far I don't know about you but there's times when I can look back and just remember that I didn't think I was going to get over that and still be in good shape. That I thought that last thing was going to really sting me and that last bill was going to take me under and that last phone call was going to be my demise. But somehow, God brought us to this day. And so we ought to celebrate and be excited because things could be much worse than they really are. This time of Rosh Hashanah is a time where they dip apples in honey and blow the shofar. The shofar, nothing more than the ram's horn. It's the same instrument used to pour the oil of the anointing. In other words, God is telling them to shout through what he pours out of. 
the same place you shout will be the same place you're anointed. I don't know if you get the correlation, but my shout goes through the same tunnel that the oil flows in. And the oil comes after the shout. See, the funny thing about us is we're backwards. We want the shout after the oil. We want to see God do it, then give him praise. But proper etiquette says give him praise because he can do it. And so God is looking for those folk that understand the use of the shofar. This blow, this, this trumpet sound, these these long winds and short winds and combinations, they announce newness. They announce and declare victory in advance. This blowing is done as an awakening, as a shaking, if you will, as a jolt that loose you out of complacency. How many of you know that you can't get comfortable? You can't get too relaxed. You can't lose your eagerness to see the move of God and be in the move of God. Uh, you can't allow the enemy to slow walk you down and infiltrate and suffocate, first of all, your peace and your joy. When you see David and the fire at Ziklag and you see that David cried all night long, he cried all night long not because there was fire in the camp. He cried all night long because the enemy took his two wives. He took the things that helped him birth other things. But when you study the names of these two wives, these two wives' names are peace and joy. <laughs> See, peace and joy will help you birth something else. These are the two things that you've got to hold nearest and dearest to you. And when the enemy comes and gets peace and joy, you almost ain't got nothing because, see, it's peace that will guard your heart and mind, and it's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. If you try to live without strength from God and your heart and mind guarded, you might as well be the walking dead. So here it is, the enemy tries to infiltrate and take our peace and our joy. But not just that, he wants our humility and our thanksgiving. And he wants our honor and our holiness. And then finally, he wants our freedom and our faith. The enemy wants to bring us down to nothing. And he does it sometimes, not because you've just walked away, but just because you stopped walking. <laughs> Some people feel like as long as I just go to church, I'm all right. But for the enemy... Just going to church is the same as leaving church because eventually he's going to catch up to you unless you be the church. If your life ain't on the move, then it's on the take. So this blowing of the shofar, not only did it awaken us, but this blowing of the shofar is supposed to remind us, I thought this was powerful, and connect us with the birthing pains of creation. I said, God, what does blowing the shofar and birthing pains of creation have to do with me? And God said, and I quote, it's to wake up the destiny embryo on the inside of every believer to prepare for the birthing of your next. So when the shofar blows on the new year, it's awakening a destiny embryo in you to be prepared to be the next thing in your life. And I thought that was interesting because in Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1, the very first word is next. How many of you know that regardless of what you've been through and where you are, 
there's still a next. That was good news to me that this thing ain't all it's going to be. And oftentimes, we think it's over, but there's still a next. Everybody doesn't have this testimony, but I'm going to tell you about me over the last few months. The devil did everything he could to this point to end my story. He hit me with this. He hit me with that. Not just one, but another one. And he did it until he thought I couldn't take no more. He wanted me to give up, but without me even trying, there was something on the inside of me that was a refusal that connected with God's rescue. Something inside of me refused to die because I was getting close to the blowing of the horn. And even though what was surrounding what was inside of me had become tired enough to stop, what was inside of me wanted to live long enough until God could rescue what was around it. And I'm telling you that if you can refuse to allow the enemy to make you think your life is over, you'll become the next set of sticks that's plucked out of the fire and you'll have the next story of greatness in God and he will allow you to see your next. Somebody shout next. Yeah. This is a significant day. It's a new year. All the way up until last night, we celebrated the coming in of the new year but today it's a new year but it's also a time that we reflect and we have to pay homage or give answer for our actions and you do this this is what I love about Christ in the privilege of privacy where you're humble and you repent and if you have opportunity you ask for forgiveness not only from God, but from others to whom you may have harmed. It's a time where you get to set the record straight. Where God is bringing you back to full restoration. It's a time where you get a new slate. You get a new clean bill of health in the spirit. It's a time where you've got fresh air. And I couldn't help it, but it's a time where you can breathe, stretch, shake, and let it go. It's one of those rituals that the, that the Jews use that they would either, they would go out and just break up pieces of bread. And they would find a flowing river and they would cast the bread in as all of their failure for the last year. Tell your neighbor, I'm watching that thing float away. I'm watching that thing float away. And you don't have to worry about it because the bread can't reverse itself and come back upstream. The only way that that bread can affect your life again is if you let somebody go get it and bring that mess back to you or you go running back to the bread that you already threw in the water. Tell your neighbor, let it alone, let it alone. If you allow God to let the, the river flow downstream, that bread don't ever have to affect your life again. So not only is it a time, I'm just talking, I'm just talking, I'll get excited, I'm trying to calm down. But it's not only a time where we have this reflection where we can repent and, and ask people for forgiveness, but it's also a special time for prayer and sacrifice. This is the time where the Jews began to adopt Genesis chapter 22 where uh, Abraham brought Isaac as a sacrifice and as he was beginning to kill uh, Isaac, the angel of the Lord hollered out and told him to look up and when he was able to look up, he was able to see what was behind him. 
Isn't that amazing that if you look behind you, you can't see what's up? But if you look up, you can see what's behind you. It's something about the mirror of the clouds in the spirit of heaven that allow you to have a panoramic view of your surroundings when you're keeping your eyes focused on the Savior. Don't you know that sometimes we've been looking in the wrong direction for the resource that's going to save our lives, for the very thing that's going to give us the sustenance that's going to take us from one dimension to the next. We've been looking in the wrong direction, and all you got to do is look up. Somebody say, look up. Look up. All you've got to do is look upward and God will show you everything that has been hidden to you for quite some time. I've always been amazed and I know I've said this before that while Abraham was walking up this mountain in Moriah that he had to already pass the, the ram. If when he was sacrificing, to, sacrificing Isaac the ram was behind him then when he came up he should have already seen it. And even if he didn't see it, a ram thought caught in the thicket makes noise. See, sometimes we get so overwhelmed trying to be obedient to God because we're trying to figure out how God's going to do something rather than just doing it and not trying to figure it out or help God out. We miss and we don't hear God's resources for our lives. And it's not until we got to kill something that we can gain something. Tell somebody, if you want it, you better kill it if you want it. So here it is. That God is now using this story in this time of our lives to say, this is the time where we bring our best before God. Ah, this is where it gets sticky. Because I've already shouted Shana Tova. I've already commended God that this is not only going to be a sweet year but they're declaring that it's going to be their best year ever but if it's going to be God's best year towards you then covenant says it's going to be your best year towards God somebody say my best year yeah this is Wednesday night uh, commitment Giving. I might say that again. Giving. See, I don't want to be that church where 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And 20% of the people do 80% of the giving. That don't make sense. You know when you was in school and you was deficient and everybody was sitting in class at the end of the day and somebody come over to the loudspeaker, McGuire, George, I need to see you in the front office. Y'all don't remember that and how that? Maybe, maybe what we'll do is we'll call Mo and Dr. Blow up here and all the non-tithers, every, we'll just go through a list of people that's not tithing and when, and when they come up, they just say, they'll say, McGuire and George, I need to see you in the finance department right away we ain't saying you ain't tithing but we need to see you <laughs> we, don't, we ain't saying you don't give but we have need to believe that you can do better <laughs> but not only your best year in commitment and giving but your best year in dedication your best year in trusting God. Your best year in serving God. And your best year in righteousness. It was low when I said giving. It got real low when I said righteousness. Our best year where we began to intensify worship, warfare, witnessing, and waiting. Our best year where we earnestly desire unity and protocol and character and stewardship. Where we want to excel in these areas and not let it be named once among us that we're not giving our all. A year where we've got a renewed diligence in seeking God and desiring to fulfill his will for our lives. 
a year where we want to always bring his name glory. A time where I finally comprehend and come in agreement with on one accord that it's not about my measure of my success, but the measure of God's obedience. That ultimately it's about my love for God and the love I give away to others. As I read about Rosh Hashanah and these 10 days and it culminates in what's known as Yom Kippur, I'm, I'm always thankful and, and I always say it's a great time for the saints because it's a time where we can get what the hillbillies call a do-over. Is there anybody in here that needs a couple do-overs? You need a do-over in a conversation. You need a do-over in a situation. You need a do-over in a relationship. You need a do-over in some area of your life. You just wish you could do it over. But we believe that God is supernaturally preparing us some do-overs. Where it may not be with that exact situation, but it will be just like that situation uh, in, in reference to the principle and the lesson. And God will give us an opportunity to pass it with flying colors. It's a time when you've been excused and allowed to try this thing again. But not because of us, but because he wants to use us for others. Not because we're special or we've got some certain position that God has to have us. But God desires us as a husband desires a bride and he will not leave us alone until he gets out of us what he wants from us remember we're agents of change God brought that to my remembrance that we're manifesting the kingdom my bishop said we're people who are being transformed in order to be conduits for transformation it's the call of God on this church that we begin to make disciples God is calling us to reproduce after our own kind. We just got to be careful what that kind is and what we're reproducing. And the kind is the kind that God called it, not the kind that we desire to be. And so we're supposed to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth with more of us. And so we have to ask the question, if it was... 500 more of me what would the church be like if everybody acted the way I act what kind of church would we be if everybody gave the way I gave if everybody lived the way I lived if everybody thought the way I thought that's the way we have to evaluate ourselves when we begin to talk about making disciples because the reality is you can only produce what you are and what you're being. And so it's not for somebody else to tell you or for somebody else to judge, just like in the communion scriptures, it says judge yourself lest you be condemned with the world. So it's our job to make disciples. It's our job to help people to become acquainted with the Zoe life that God has predestined for them. And not only for them to have this life, but to flourish in it and to be fruitful. So we must accept this challenge. We must accept the fact that God has called us this even when we don't want to be. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's days where kind of ignorantly in my flesh or my emotions that I wish I wasn't the pastor. And it's a dichotomy. Some days, it's, I ain't cut out for this. Other days, it's, I'm tired of dealing with these <laughs> Negroes. I, I might as well just kept it real. Ain't no sense in me acting like I put it all on me. <laughs> so it's a dichotomy. And every person goes through that from time to time when you feel that strain of ministry on your life. Some people don't feel it because they ain't really doing ministry. So you can't say amen. But for the people that are really trying to allow God to use them, even in your own deficiencies, you understand what I'm talking about. Some people can't shout when I say certain things because it don't affect you because the devil ain't looking for you. Because he ain't mad about nothing that you're doing. 
you just as indifferent as anything else, and you just uh, a little buckeye that can't produce nothing else. You, you're just sitting around for show. So the enemy's not worried about you. But for the people that God is using and God has impressed upon their heart that even though they know they're not all that in a bag of chips, that they've agreed with God to give their life over to him, there's process that we've got to go through. Somebody say process. And process isn't always fun and it show sure ain't easy. I heard somebody say one day pimping ain't easy. Well, process ain't easy either. It costs you a whole lot to be processed. It costs you a whole lot to go through. And sometimes you don't go through for yourself, but you're going through for somebody else. And you don't even understand why the ham fat you going through it until years later till you meet this knucklehead that you were processed Four. But this is the call. This is what we have to accept about who we are. And so the Bible says that after this process has taken place, after you've had to be patient and resilient and obedient and conformed and after you have to go through this excessive line of, of, of faith and making sure that God can use you, then you've got to try some kind of way to be steadfast and to stand strong. And isn't it funny that while God is processing you, people are judging you. See, because the thing about processing is not only do you get squeezed for the anointing to come out, but you get squeezed for the foolishness to come out. And so while God is squeezing you and getting rid of some stuff, isn't it funny that as a meat goes through a grinder and you squeeze it, you get to smell what's coming out. And that's the thing about people. They can only smell what's being exposed, but they can't see where you're going. So they only comment about what they smell. Yeah. Look at your neighbor say, you sniffing me, but keep on watching. You, you all up in my mix with your nose, but keep your eyes on me. You want to talk about what comes up in your nostrils, but uh, just wait a little while till you see from your eyes what God's getting ready to do with my life. I ain't going to always smell like this. I got a shower in heaven that's getting ready to rain down on me. And while you're talking about how I smell, I see you when I get back to help you get to the shower. But you see, sometimes you can only smell what you've already smelled before. You know funk because you've been funky. <laughs> but God is processing us. He's making us strong through process. That's why the day is so special. That's why the new year is so special. Because in the midst of the last 12 months of process, you made it. You didn't hurt nobody or hurt yourself. You, you made it. You didn't, you didn't finish that thing you was about to start. You made it. You didn't take all them things you was about to take. You made it. You didn't walk in front of what you was about to walk in front of. You made it. It didn't feel good, but you made it through. I told somebody yesterday, why are they talking about you? Smile loud. Because they don't know the hell you survived. <laughs> they just know the hell somebody repeated. They don't know the hell you survived. And if they thought that was the story to talk about, they ought to catch you front news on the paper in about six months from now. They ought to catch you live on Channel 7 about six months from now. Slap your neighbor and say, peek a -boo, I'm coming out in a minute. You're watching me on the inside of my cave, but I ain't going to live in the dark forever. Say ain't where it's going to be. I'm being processed. The wonderful thing, but the most dangerous thing about God processing you is when you allow God to do it, you, come acquaint, you become acquainted with stuff that you forgot was still in you. How 
many times you done looked up and thought, I thought that was gone. I thought, I thought that was over. I didn't think I thought like that no more. I thought that stuff was out of me. I didn't know that somebody could still bring that part of me out. I didn't know. I kept living in the daylight, but the freaks come out at night. When it got dark, I found out that I still had a little something, something going on down in my heart, down in my heart. Uh, God is the way, he has a way of processing you to get down, like my mama said, to the nitty gritty. That's why David says, search my heart. I done tricked myself enough times. I done lied to myself enough times. I done fooled myself enough times. I ain't looking in my heart no more. You look in it, and I'm just going to stand here and take it. He said, then you put me in your way. I've been trying this, and I'm frustrating myself. But then Jesus said, but when you're converted, Now see, I need you to know that after you've been through some of this stuff and you come through and you, you allow God to process you and you allow that change to take place, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know, you was anointed then, but now you anointed like a mug. Slap somebody and say, I'm anointed like a mug. I'm anointed like a mug. Now, hey, I don't know what you can say about my anointing now. I was anointed before I went through hell, but I done survived hell. Now I'm anointed. Than a mug. I got something now. But the whole key, watch this. But the whole key wasn't just to get converted. The whole key wasn't just to get anointed. The whole key wasn't just so you can look like you survived. The whole key wasn't so you could just shout and run around. The whole key wasn't so you could gloat about what you survived. The whole key ain't about your testimony and your witness. The whole key is so you can help bring some other folk back into the fold. Get some people saved. Let God use what he's got allowed you to go through to raise somebody up in the kingdom while you've been going through selfishly you forgot that this thing ain't even about you crying and whining to God about how long what you doing why you doing it and God said you ought to hush and be glad I'm using you I could have left you in hell 15 years ago I could have left you on the door 7 years ago I could have left you in that bed a few months ago I could have left you in your dirt last night So the prophet said in 60 verse 1, Isaiah, he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. We about ready to go home. In the net Bible, I felt Baptist right there. He said, Arise, and shine for your light arrives and the splendor of the Lord shines on you. Somebody say on you. Not only is it on you, but tell somebody it's on you. In other words, it's your time. This is your season. You better quit expecting everybody else to go witness. It's on you. <laughs> you better quit acting everybody, asking everybody else to get right. It's on you. You better quit looking for the bishop to go out there and bring people into the kingdom. It's on you. It's time for us to witness. It's time for us to be the light. It's time for us to show the glory of God. Because if I ain't got nobody saved in about a year, then I don't know what my salvation is all about. If I have not been witnessing and leading somebody to Christ, then what the heck am I doing? It's an indictment if you haven't invited somebody to Christ or your church in the last month. Because we'll invite people to a sale. We'll invite people to a restaurant. We'll invite people to a game. We'll invite people to a hairstyle. We'll invite people to our barber. We'll invite people to our beautician. We'll invite people where we got a new car. What about where you got a new life? Tell somebody it's on you, it's on you. The splendor of the Lord shines on you. In the living Bible it says, arise my people 
Let your light shine for all the nations to see. For the glory of the Lord is streaming from you. It should be so much in you that you can't keep it contained. It's like a zit that finds heat. It oozes without you touching it. Your, your salvation should be a white head. And if any kind of heat get near it, the substance of it ought to bust out before somebody can get their hands on it. Slap somebody and say, you full of it, you full of it, you full of it. It ought to be full of witness. You ought to be bubbling over waiting on that thing to get pricked. You, need, uh, you ought to wake up in the morning and say, I just need somebody to say one thing to me. Because if we be honest, that's what we said on the other side. If somebody say one thing to me, I'm going off. That ought to be a new t-shirt, Shirley. If somebody say one thing to me, it's coming out. All of my witness, all of my experience, all of my testimony, all of my pain, but my victory is getting ready to come out. And I wake up with the anticipation of somebody pricking my bump. Look at your neighbor and say, what's that on your face? It ought to be something that we're waiting for somebody to agitate for it to come out. In the message Bible it says, get out of bed, Jerusalem. Wake up. Put your face in the sunlight. See, you know that you're not excited about your salvation when you wake up and the light hits you and you pull the cover over your head. I did that the other day and God said, why aren't you excited that I woke you up to talk about me? It's Sunday morning. I think for some of us, we exercise our snooze button too often. But he said, get out of bed, Jerusalem. Wake up. Put your face in the sunlight. God's bright glory. Watch this. It ain't risen on you in this translation. It has risen what? For you. This, this is the day... God wants to do something for you. That's why the psalmist said, lift up your heads. O ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of who? Glory shall come in. There's something God wants to do for us. In the Amplified, it says, arise from the depression and prostration. What's prostration, Bishop? Somebody say that. Yeah, you ain't got to be embarrassed to ask. You didn't know what that meant. Trying to break it down. It means to be low in spirit. Watch this. You might find yourself. It means to be weary. Getting a little tired. But watch how it moves climactically. It means to be heavy hearted. It means to be in despair. See, in despair means I'm, I'm trying to feel good, but I can't. I'm trying to look happy, but it ain't normal. See, that's what a, that's what a, look, look at your neighbor and say, despair. See, despair on your car, it looked like a regular tire, or you trying to make it like it's a regular tire, but you know something ain't right with it. That's what despair is. I'm trying to fake like everything's all right, but really I ain't quite like I'm supposed to be, and even though I'm rolling, I'm off balance. And even though it might get me from A to B, I can't ride like this. That's, that's 
despair. And see, that's the enemy that's creeping into the church more than anything. Because as long as I shout like everybody else, don't nobody have to know that I'm really broke down. So not only low in spirit, weary, heavy hearted, in despair, but agony of the mind. Prostration means to be in agony of the mind. Broken hearted. Exhausted. Miserable. On the brink of a nervous breakdown. And what nothing slick about these synonyms, they write in the thesaurus. So here's Isaiah saying, arise from that. Watch this. It's because of the circumstances that you've allowed to keep you like that. You've let your circumstances, dilemmas, predicaments, vicissitudes, stuff you go through, daily life, have soup, ha, ha, listen, override and supersede what God says. He said, rise to a new life. Shine, be radiant with the glory of God, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you or it's appearing and you're about to manifest. See, I ain't got no money line, but I just prophesied. I should have had a money line, then y'all know I was prophesying. God gives us a word for our time that even though it was written aforehand, the Bible says. But it's given to us in our time so we might apply it now. Uh, it's called Alexandrian hermeneutics. You take an Old Testament truth and you make a, a present day application. And all I tried to say was, if you could rise to a new life, right in the midst of your feeling, depression and prostration, that God will begin to manifest his glory in your life. See, because we've been anointed to be the light in darkness. We've been anointed to be the hope in hopelessness. We've been anointed to be the witness in the chaos. We've been anointed to give a voice and have a shofar blow out of our mouths and out of our bellies to awaken the downcast. And we must not forget the method of Jesus. Acts 10, 38, and I'm getting ready to let you go home. Then Jesus arrived. Lord, have mercy. I wish I was a preacher. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth anointed by God with the Holy Spirit then Mark arrived from drug addiction anointed by God with the Holy Spirit then Nate arrived from being a dope fiend, <laughs> anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. Can I use some of y'all testimony in here? <laughs> then Chelsea arrived uh, from Hoen, uh, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to help somebody in here. Then Steve arrived uh, from Hormungan, uh, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. Uh, then Mo arrived uh, from drunkenness, uh, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. Uh, then Ron arrived uh, from manipulation, uh, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't know what your Nazareth is, but the way my God works, uh, he brings you out uh, of your Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. Can any good thing uh, come from a dope fiend, from a hole, uh, from a whoremonger, from a wino, uh, from a manipulator? Uh, somebody shout Jesus! He arrived 
tell somebody I'm about to arrive. He arrived. God gave us the method. We're about to arrive. Right out of our Nazareth. But watch this. He was filled with the Holy Ghost for a reason though. Somebody say ready for action. (laughs) Some of y'all done came out of prison. Anointed by God. With the Holy Spirit. But it's ready for action. And the enemy, he's so subtle. He tries to wrap us back into our Nazareth and he tries to keep you from where you've come from and the Bible says that he went through the country helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil and he was able to do all this because God was with him Next time somebody look at you like you're crazy because they know what you've been through, just tell them God with me. <laughs> uh, I'm, 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 I'm going through the country. I'm dealing with some stuff. I, I find myself in the wilderness every now and then, but God's still with me. Tell somebody I ain't left God <laughs> and he ain't left me. So we can't forget what God has done. And not only for what he's done, but what he's done for and in us. And he's done it so that he can do something through us. And it's to impact those that are around us every day. And God's shown us the way. And Jeremiah, you don't have to go there, but it says, I know the thoughts. And that's because God has given us purpose. He's given us potential. He's given us passion. And he's given us a platform. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. In the year 5773, in 2012 and 2013, God is calling and he's saying the time is at hand. And watch what God told me today. I'm releasing power from the pews. Not to the pews. You should have already been receiving that. Some of you have been around here too long doing nothing. He's releasing power from the pews. Now this is going to disrupt some relationships. This is going to disrupt some comfort zones and some status quo. But we got to allow God to get us right so that we can go out there so they can get right. We complain about the community because we ain't right. Because if we were as right as we say we are, the community would already be changing. Because it's not about what we do in here. It's what they see out there. And watch this, even if you holy, but you're holy and indifferent, you've become what they are afraid of. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Let me help you. And the Bible says they were naked and not ashamed. So Paul was saying, I'm transparent about who I am and what I'm going through. (laughs) But I'm not ashamed of the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. You're looking at me and I'm opening myself up to you and I ain't ashamed of what God is doing in my life. So come on, y'all can sing. 
Luke 10, 1 through 9 says, the Lord now, somebody say now. The Bible says the Lord now, somebody say now. Some, the Lord now, somebody say now. In, in Zechariah, it said next. And Luke is saying now. Chose 70 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and villages he planned to visit later. Reason why you're frequenting what you're frequenting is because in a minute the anointing is getting ready to show up. And God's getting ready to bring himself to light in the areas of where you've been frequenting. And if we're not careful, the, the gospel is either going to expose us for what we're not. Or it's going to use us for who he is. And so God is saying, get yourself in order because I'm on my way. And I'm getting ready to prove who I am. These were his instructions to them. Plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers to help you. For the harvest is so plentiful and the workers so few. Go now and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you or a beggar's bag or even an extra pair of shoes. And don't waste time along the way. One translation says don't have a bunch of foolish conversation with people that's not trying to go nowhere. Whenever you enter a home, give it your blessing. In other words, don't ride through the neighborhood talking about it. Prophesy over it. Don't go to your job talking about how much you hate it. Prophesy in there. Don't go to school wishing you would hurry up and don't have to deal with this teacher. Prophesy that God has made it fertile ground for the glory of God. So it is, if it's worthy of the blessing, the blessing will stand. If not, the blessing will return to you. Slap somebody and say, what you got to lose? When you enter a village, don't shift around from home to home, but stay in one place, eating and drinking without question what is ever, and drinking without question whatever is set before you. And don't hesitate to accept hospitality, for the workman is worthy of his wages. If a town welcomes you, follow these two rules. Eat what's set before you. Heal the sick. And as you heal them, say, the kingdom of God is very near you now. So what did I say? I gave you the four methods of Jesus. Simple theology for us. Something that you've heard before over and over again. But sometimes we get so jacked up, we forget what we're supposed to be doing. We get so high and mighty and spiritual that we forget to condescend to the lowest, to the estate of low men, that you might save some, that you become all things to all people, that you become relative in what you're doing. The way Jesus told us that we're supposed to win souls is when you go into a bad situation, the first thing you're supposed to do is bless it. Open your mouth with something positive. Say something prophetic that would bring it back to life. You can't be on your job acting a fool and think God's going to use you with the same people that saw you act a fool. But isn't it good that that was then <laughs> and this is now? Isn't it good that it's a new year and you can start this thing over? But not only bless them, don't be so spiritual that you can't fellowship. Don't, don't, I ain't talking about you done made this your best friend, but you really can't help nobody till you done spent time around them. People could care less how much you know until they know how much you care. You've got to be willing to sit with some folk and talk to some people. Folk ask me all the time, why you fool with them? And I say, because God fools with me. I don't know what, how God's going to use them. But I want to make sure that I've done what I could on this day to be a blessing to their life. Then the Bible says that in that same set of texts that if you find there's a need, minister to it. Heal them that are sick. Pray for them that need prayer. Don't let somebody say they need God and you don't pray for them in that moment. You ain't in that much of a rush. If you are, you should have left your house a long time ago. Because remember, we get up believing God wants to use us. 
Most of us got influence right in before our eyes. We're pastors right where we are. We're the only Bible many people gonna ever see. Somebody suggested about their voicemail and should they change it? So absolutely. Months ago, year, year and a half ago. Brought back to my remembrance last night. We talked about it. They changed it. Somebody called their phone this week and just listened to the voicemail. Just listen to the voicemail. Just listen to the voicemail. I get it all the time. The bishop said, why you got that long freaking message on your voicemail? And I do it every October. I change it. And I say, Dad, people just call and listen to the voicemail. Just listen to the voicemail. They'll call me sometimes and say, please don't pick up. Let it go to the voicemail. Why? Because people need an encouraging word. But we in such a rush. We so freaking holy. We got so many things to do that we can't stop and see what somebody needs and then minister to them. Because after you see about that need, after you've been blessing and prophesying and eulogizing, eulogio, that's the word to speak well of, why folk got to be dead before we say something sweet? Why folk go to their grave and we just now saying, you know, I thought they were a wonderful person? They might just need that. They might just need to hear you say, hey, listen, I forgive you. They might just need to hear you say, hey, just thinking about you, I know God wants to do something great with you. It doesn't matter what they're doing, but it's about ministering to them. And then once you've done that, you can proclaim the kingdom. The Bible says, and the kingdom was nigh unto you. And we know in Romans it says it's nigh us, even in our mouths. All they got to do then is confess Jesus, and you've won a soul to the kingdom. So there's a method to this madness. There's an outcome that God's trying to get. There's a measure, there's a rod, there's a cannon that he's trying to perform in our lives. There's a reason you're being processed the way you're being processed. He told us to be strong. But don't forget why we're here. And so if that's, if that's been you, where you just haven't really been allowing God to use you like you know God wants to use you, we don't even have to come up tonight. I just want you to raise your hand. I just want you to raise your hand where you are. You want to be used of God. You want to make an impact. You know, you know you've been through enough that it can bless somebody else. And we're not worried about what nobody thinks because the Bible says he arrived out of Nazareth. You're ready to arrive. Tell somebody I'm ready to arrive. I'm ready to arrive. It don't matter how long you haven't. And the Bible says arise, get out of bed. We got to quit being lazy in the Holy Ghost. Father, I thank you right now for the people who just have determined that they know that there's more to their lives than meet the eye. God, we, some of us have been doing it and doing it, but we know there's more. Some of us just really haven't given the effort, and now we know that it's time. Some of us have been afraid or indifferent, and just some of us just haven't done anything, God, and we know that that's a shame because of how good you've been to us. But we're thankful for this moment. We're thankful for an apostolic declaration of a new year of a shift and a sift. We're thankful that, God, you're doing something fresh, that there's a fresh aroma of righteousness around us and in our lives. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for getting us to this point. Thank you, God, for changing us. Now, God, use us. And, God, we know the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into your hand, but yet David said, I'd rather fall into your hand than the hand of the enemy. And so God, process us, fix us. We know there'll be some squeezing and some tempering and some breaking. But it's a broken vessel that's an open vessel. So help us, God. Help us to lose that spirit that's not right. Help us to get rid of that stench that's messing up the aroma of your anointing, your holiness in our lives. Help us tonight, God. And then use us, pour us out. Help us to strengthen the brethren. Help us to witness to the lost. Help us, God, to be used of you to be wise and to win souls into the kingdom. We love you, sir, and we honor you. And God, tonight, just for a few seconds, we're just going to bless you.
because of who you are. And we're going to declare right in the midst of our circumstance that we are arising and allowing your glory to shine on us, for us, and out of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on and shout like you believe it. Come on, give God some praise. We serve an awesome God. We serve an awesome God. Slap three people and tell them be strong. Slap three people and tell them be strong. Be strong. Be strong. Be strong. We ready to give? Come on. We're giving. They're singing. We're giving. We're just going to start right now. We're giving. They're singing. Father, thank us for these seeds. Thank us for our offering. Thank you for accepting our best in Jesus' name. Come on.